Coming up on this episode of The Roundtable. It's not going to be one world united by tech. It's going to be major theological level differences, not fake diversity, but real differences, incommensurable differences, cosmic wagers on the significance of our humanity and our relationship to God. And now is as good a time as any. There's, you know, in some ways, there's never been a time to find people who sync up with you on, on, at that level and start building with them. The field is open. And many of those who have money, many of those who have power are struggling and flailing right now because they, they either don't have the, the theological rooting or they don't have the practical experience or they're just too old and corrupt. And the adrenochrome has run out due to supply chain issues. I mean, many, many reasons. But the field is open for, for ordinary Americans to, to lock in on what matters most and take practical steps to defend and protect it for themselves and for their posterity. And, you know, in a way that brings us full circle. That's always what we've been about. Hello and welcome to The Round Table, the final, the ultimate episode for 2021. Much of the world is beginning to settle into their long winter's nap, and that includes our fearless leader, Ryan Williams. And so you're stuck with me, Spencer Clavin. This, of course, is the editors and publishers podcast of The American Mind, and I'm joined by executive editor James Poulos and founding editor Matthew Peterson, please be aware that this is not only our 100th episode, so we accept celebratory presents in the form of cash or check, but it's also the last episode of the year. We will not record an episode next week, and so this is our culminating 100th episode extravaganza, my year-long effort to uh, displace and undermine Ryan as the host of this podcast has now at last come to fruition. I have stolen the mic from him on this day of days episode 100, final episode of the year. Uh, my maniacal evil plan is complete. No, he'll be back next, next year. Uh, but we are going to pal around a little bit uh, at the end of the year here and just look back at some of the uh, <laughs> insane madness that has gone on over the course of 2021. We were talking off mic before we started recording about all the different news stories that we could pull up as evidence of stuff that you could show to yourself two years ago and, and you wouldn't believe yourself. This, uh, there, there's so much going on that you just, when you actually step back and take a look at it, you realize, wow, that's literally happening. That article literally got published. That inflation rate is, is real. Um, and so we thought we would take some time at the end of the year and on, at, on this momentous episode to take stock um, first of some kind of shocking articles that are currently in the news and then using those as a way to look back at just how we got here and where we're going. How is it that articles like this could possibly exist? Um, and given that they do, what's our, uh, what should our, uh, what should our goals be going forward and what should our, uh, attitude be about 2022, 2024, um, and indeed life even beyond that in America. Um, so I'm going to basically just toss various little bits of red meat uh, into the uh, Coliseum here and let, let us all have at it, by which I mean I'm going to read some truly remarkable headlines and paragraphs, um, and then we'll, we'll take it away. Um, the first one here is from Bloomberg, uh, a, an article, a, a, an outlet with which I'm sure our listeners are familiar. And the headline is, for Americans shocked by inflation, Argentines have some advice. You're familiar, I suppose, with Argentina, um, <laughs> South American bastion of high inflation and um, disastrous economic policy. And so, you know, this is we've moved now from inflation is not happening to uh, maybe we should look at uh, what Argentines have to say about our economic situation. Um, and the advice includes... Um, spend your paycheck right away. In a high inflation economy, money that sits in the bank is losing value. Each day, those $100 on deposit 
by a little bit less. As a result, many Argentines spend their paycheck as soon as they receive them, carting away weeks worth of groceries in a single shopping trip, even if some of it, excess meat, chicken, fish, will sit in the freezer for months. <laughs> uh, other pieces of advice include borrow lots of money, negotiate a pay raise or two. Um, so, gents, uh, I assume you'll be taking some advice from your helpful, friendly neighborhood Argentine. Uh, you might even consider perhaps purchasing a wheelbarrow with which to cart your uh, <laughs> newly worthless dollar bills to your, oh, I don't know, uh, local, uh, your, your local Weimar Republic reenactment station. Um, what do you make of all this? Uh, it's, you know, <clears throat> how, how much further do we have to go until the money does not even have to touch your hands, your, your account? Why even have, you know, why do I not cut out the middleman? The, you know, state issues the, the money. The money is issued directly to whoever it is who's supposed to give you stuff. The stuff arrives at your door or, you know, appears virtually in front of your waving hands. Um, why do we even need people to be paid directly at all under this system? Um, this is a question that I expect to be asked. Uh, this is a question I expect to be answered by people who... Uh, propose cutting out the middleman of the the income earner um, as our next great technological advancement. I mean, yeah, I mean, the peasantry. I, I don't, I, I mean, I, you look at this and it is just hilarious to me. I, just, yeah, I have to laugh at these kinds of articles um, because you just, it's like unexpected, right? I mean, you think that the regime propaganda wouldn't be this hilarious, but it's literally saying spend all your money. Eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you die. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. No, for real though. Uh, so I think, you know, I mean, it's just a sign of the times. There's not even a, uh, the, the masks have been off for a while, but now, as James suggests, we're moving into uncharted territory where it's just, no, no, really, you won't own anything. <laughs> and there's no reason... <laughs> There's no reason for you to uh, to be dealing with the monies at all, uh, and we're going to supply we're going to supply everything you need. And by the way, I mean if this is already informally the case, then I, I know that you know we live in a society now. Excuse me, where you go out and routinely, right when you go to restaurants, especially small local family owned places or fast food places um, if we're on a road trip or whatever, and you notice there's just a manager working. Um, you know, even in Texas, there's a local, uh, a local restaurant, it's a small little place, family owned, does okay on the weekends, but they've had to reduce their hours because there are no employees, there are no workers, and we will all be, you know, serfs plugged into uh, to God knows what. Um, but, but I mean, you have to wonder for every person who's uh, laughing at this uh, and then the ones who aren't reading it are just going along and spending all their money, I suppose. There are increasing amounts of Americans, I think, who are going, well, I better buy uh, Bitcoin, I better buy real estate. And, uh, you know, who are making these moves and thinking about what is actually going to survive. Um, I don't know. I feel like it was a long time ago, like maybe two years ago, when I started looking up the Wikipedia references as the basis for research on what happens during rapid inflation, right? <laughs> so media, media friends is a good, is, is a decent bet. People are still going to need to be entertained. Um, so yeah. Hint, hint. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, what does, what gets me about this is the like open council of despair. You might as well have just titled this head this article you know do go gently into that good night like people are already i'm sure feeling beaten down by this year by these two years uh, i in fact i know that i know i talk to people and the number one thing that i hear is like it's just relentless i just feel like there's this steady drumbeat of bad news bad policy decisions you know bad uh, bad if, you know bad prospects for the future and I feel like even though I know that I shouldn't just give into this, I just sometimes it gets me down, you know, and I feel as if like a good 50 percent of that is actual 
concerted effort on the part of the cathedral propaganda organization, the, the mainstream news or whatever you want to call it, right? They, they genuinely, whatever other conspiracy theories you may or may not acquiesce to, I think it's fair to say that they, they genuinely want you demoralized so that you'll give up. Like, just stop fighting, damn you, you know, stop resisting our vaccines, stop pesky, pescally going on about your free choice and your guns and your and your money. Just shut up and die already, you know, and it actually is a testimony to the spirit of the American people when you think about it, that they have to keep wringing our necks like this or, you know, stomping the boot into the face over and over again. Like, it, of course, people are 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 feeling downtrodden. Of course, they feel like you know, that they, I, I just, you know, I don't know what to do about this. I feel like so many of these decisions are beyond my control that, you know, all of the forces that are beyond my power are hostile to me. And, and like, it's, it's remarkable, actually, that in that context and in the context of how abysmally Biden has, has managed things and how oppressive the COVID stuff has been, it's remarkable that in that context, they even need news organs to come out with this kind of garbage and just say to people like just acquiesce already just consent you know and it does make people feel as if like oh i must be the only one who actually doesn't want to just slip slide nicely into the metaverse and have all my goods delivered to me virtually direct from the government you know i mean i think it's a big part of it it's just so that you don't you feel as if you are the only person who would who would read an a headline like you know just do as the argentines do and think like that's just that disgusts me my pride is offended my honor is offended i mean i i actually think like it, if there's a weight pull in this it's just that they have to keep drum beating this into people because it means that people actually haven't uh, haven't given up yeah don't you think i mean that's one of the things we could say of kind of year end review that uh, you know, the new level that we've attained uh, in this country um, this year is is really these kinds of, I don't even want to call them narratives, more like commands now, you know, totally. where we've ascended to this new level where it's not like very complicated, you know, Russian collusion and P tapes and the blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, that, it's all very complicated for this. This is more just, you know, pure tarred level of uh, you know, more on level, like just spend all your money. It, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, or the article that, uh, uh, that one Dr. Polis published uh, a long time ago about people just giving up. What was the, I forget the title. He'll remember uh, where it's just people just tuning out. And now they're just, why bother? Saying, yeah. Why bother? Now they're just saying, don't bother. Tune out. Be done. And there is something, you know, refreshingly uh, clear about that, I suppose. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, the great example of this is like the, the little news feed stuff that they put on the, the right side of your Twitter page. Like if you log into Twitter desktop now, um, which <laughs> my, my major year in review <laughs> news is that I've deleted Twitter off of my phone. That's like the most momentous <laughs> for, for in terms of psychological health. I will say that is the most momentous event of my 2021. But when I log on now to desktop, the tweet articles or whatever, um, they give you these like summations of different news stories and the kind of top line takeaway and half the time it's like you know the great reset is a good thing experts say like the, the you're right matt like the the subtlety of it has now descended to like you know sub chinese levels you xi jinping's propaganda is like way more sophisticated than ours and and yeah i, I don't think it's like like all propaganda it's not like you have to believe it it's just you have to accept the mood of it and the mood is exactly what what James was saying in that article, and we were just like, why bother? You know, it's already in the air. They're just trying that, you know, that's the spirit that they want to cultivate. And, you know, the opposite should be the case. So real quick, I mean, the, the real advice is it's time to get uh, to really think about self-sufficiency in a serious way, to really exactly. think about, you know, redirecting your resources such as they are uh, into things that that will last um, and when will, you know, will go past. Obviously, um, you know, I mean, I, I can't say I'm an expert, but I, I'm just lucky things have fallen into place. And I've also pushed to make things fall into place in a very small way, microcosm in my own life, right? I mean, anyone has moved to a red state and purchased a home, good on you. That was a good move, right? Hmm. Um, you just you just parked money into something that, that's going to increase in value, not decrease. And then the entrepreneurial aspect of this is you know, there's a lot of money washing around this economy that needs to go into people building new things. 
And that's actually uh, something that in the next year, you're going to see a hell of a lot more of. And as these uh, mom and pop um, stores and medium-sized businesses kind of crumble underneath the weight of the Borg and everything that's happened to them, uh, the only way they're going to survive is with a larger play that seeks to purchase them and plug them into a larger infrastructure. Uh, <laughs> guys, have you heard about this new founding thing I'm part of? Anyway, um, <laughs> so 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 the, the idea that, I mean, private equity knows this. People People are starting to realize there's a hell of a lot of opportunity out there both as an individual and, uh, you know, as part of something larger, where, of course, you know, extreme circumstances make for um, opportunity that wasn't there before. So I'm not saying this because, you know, my free market's going to save us all and everything's great, actually. I'm saying this because when you're dealt, uh, you know, a shit hand, you got you to gotta play the cards you have. And there are some cards to be played right now for people on the right and just for regular people, uh, you know, they, they can get out of the, there's ways to start porting yourself out of the system now uh, in, in ways that aren't weird and, and creepy and going to screw you. And, you know, you have to say cryptocurrency. I mean, even that article that you were reading had to begrudgingly admit, you know, <laughs> one of the things you do if you're part of an inflationary currency and you were in Argentina is you try to buy the U.S. dollar, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> ironic now. But it mentions that what have people been doing for the past few years who want to get out of the U.S. dollar? Well, you know, there's a, there are some electronic currencies you may have heard about um, that people are really into uh, for a reason, and they've been vindicated. Yeah, I, this is a really – turns out this is a helpful conversation for me. Like I, I, I find it helpful to reflect on the fact that there is a category of thought in – my life that goes something like, wow, I sure am reading a lot of news stories about crypto or wow, I sure I'm really reading a lot of news stories about inflation or gosh, you know, it sure looks like people are moving out of red states. And there's this drumbeat in the back of my head of like, oh, I should probably get on that. And then there's also the complacency that is just like, you know, you can't fathom, you can't picture your life in this new world because it involves doing stuff that you've just never done before. And it just seems insurmountable, even if you know it's not to like look into crypto to actually start your side hustle to, you know, invest in something like new founding. Like, um, and, and every time I've gotten over that hump, I've, it's been like one of the best decisions of my life. Like Matt, you mentioned moving to a red state, buying a house, owning property, you know, that's, there, there's just an enormous mechanism in, in my head. And so I imagine there is a bigger mechanism in other people's head that, that like stops them that just stops me from like it, conceiving of that as a thing you actually do. It's just something you talk about in like the group chat, like, oh yeah, we should all be moving to red states. But yeah, like now is the like a good New Year's resolution would be to actually execute on a lot of those plans because it's kind of the counter. It's like the antidote to this Bloomberg article. It's the opposite of the Bloomberg article. Yeah, and let me, let me yeah let me say I mean I know I mean I'm I'm more of a probably more of a wild man in some ways than than maybe most people. I don't know, but. Um, in terms of taking chances, I think for a lot of people, it's like, look, I have, you know, I have a decent gig going. It's not perfect, but I have what I have and I'm doing what I do. And, uh, you know, these things sound good, but why would I do it now? And what, the, what, what you have to wrap your head around, if that's you listening, is you're just look at what they're saying. You're just going to get screwed if you keep doing this. Right? And, you know, at a certain point, the risk aversion needs to flip in the other direction. And you need to say, if I keep doing what I'm doing. They're telling me, spend all your money, you'll own nothing and be happy. Uh, and you're not, you can see that this is going to lead to disaster. So, uh, you know, the real, the less risky thing to do is, is to actually make some of these moves now. And uh, I don't think you're, you're going to regret it. I mean, the, the moving one is a big one. I mean, obviously, everyone's in a different circumstance. Everyone wants to move to a dis different place. But I, I don't, you look at that Life After California <laughs> Facebook group, it was like a self-help group with 70,000 people in it. Uh, you see, you know, these people who have moved, like no one is regretting it. The only place I've seen people regret it is in the PSYOPs and like the Wall Street Journal had something about how all oh, these people buying houses are just, they're moving too fast. And a lot of them regret what they're doing. Like BS, people are, people are moving and they're, they're happy. Uh, and, and when it comes to the crypto stuff, like, look, I don't know, there's no guarantees in life and what the hell do I know? But, um, but I certainly know uh, the strong advocates of, of moving in that direction. And the reason there's such a big war um, that uh, going on now with where to go next is because everyone knows that they have to go somewhere new next. 
And wherever they go new is not going to be the same as the old thing, and those moves are needed. And therefore, uh, some of the most interesting intellectual energy right now is, is uh, people arguing with each other about where things should go. Um, and and I, w- I would just encourage like people who are looking, if you, if you are in an entrepreneurial mode and you're looking to create new things right now, I mean, look, there, there is a lot of, you know, for the, for the people who are wealthy, they're doing great. It's been a great year. And there's a lot of money running around uh, that you know people want to deploy in some way, and and park somewhere and and, and into building things. So you know, I mean, it it, it is. It's just the, it's the time. It's the time to act. Plus, what yeah, else? It's, you, it's, you, a, you it's, it's a it's a time to act. And I think a lot of you know, for Americans of a certain age, have had it drummed into their head since they were kids that the only way to make a difference is by changing the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, what people are now discovering is that it's really more or less impossible to change the world. Um, you know, if we're, if we're talking about news stories that, that made a difference in our lives this year, um, I think the, the recent news that the, the Build Back Better bill is not going to be passed is a significant piece of news. Uh, this is a piece of legislation with a magic name on it. A name that you can magically invoke to cause magical things to happen that change the world. Uh, I mean, we've all seen the, you know, the, the pics of the Build Back Better motto plastered over everyone's podium it, you know, around the world except for a handful of bad guy countries. And we've watched as every member of the Five Eyes Alliance has gone insane. Uh, just wave after wave of lockdowns, failed policies, social credit systems, uh, COVID camps. I mean, UK, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, all of these places are completely losing their minds right now. And it's not just those. It's South Korea too, social credit system. The Swedes have invented the, the chip that you can put your Vax Pass on and put the chip inside your hand. Of course, it would stop with that because it's really just about beating the virus. Wrong. Um, we've seen these things unfold and, you know, what we're discovering, <clears throat> some of us more, more recently than others, uh, is that not even those in charge can change the world in the way that they set out to do. In fact, you cannot dream it or sorry, you cannot do it just because you dream it and your passion is not enough. And that should be good news to ordinary Americans. Because we are long overdue for messaging that says, you know what, you can take immediate action personally in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of your church, in the life of your community, your neighborhood, you know, at the local level, at the state level. You know, there's this huge, vast, you know, the new frontier is, is intermediary institutions. The new frontier is right outside your door. And, you know, and, and people are, are making these choices haltingly, but they're starting to realize if the bad news is that no one's coming to save them, the good news is that if they act now, there's probably no one who's going to get in their way. There's the eye of Sauron isn't what it used to be. And there isn't going to be one ring to rule them all. So that means that you have to, you know, you've got to bet on yourself and you have to have a framework that is tuned in enough to reality that you can, you know, that you can make big wagers and that you can be the kind of person who can lead others to make those big wagers on, you know, on, on the success of, yeah, you know, your small business or whatever, your enterprise, but this, this scales up not to swallow the entire world in a moment of change, but up to the level of a culture, up to the level of a civilization, there are going to be starkly different responses to what technology has unleashed on the world. It's not going to be one size fits all. It's not going to be one world united by tech. It's going to be major theological level differences, not fake diversity, but real differences, incommensurable differences, cosmic wagers on the significance of our humanity and our relationship to God. And now is as good a time as any. There's, you know, in some ways there's never been a time to find people who sync up with you on, on, at that level and start building with them. The field is open. And many of those who have money, many of those who have power are struggling and flailing right now because they, they either don't have the, the theological rooting or they don't have the practical experience or they're just too old and corrupt and the adrenochrome has run out due to supply chain issues. I mean, many, many reasons. 
but the field is open for for ordinary Americans to to lock in on what matters most and take practical steps to defend and protect it for themselves and for their posterity. And, you know, in a way that brings us full circle. That's always what we've been about. I mean, I, I just, I mean, that, that really is it. I mean, people, yeah, I, let me just personal confession at the end of the year. I mean, I spent as a weirdo kind of my entire life thinking about, you know, natural law, the traditions of the West and political philosophy, classically understood and all this stuff. And, and it, you know, it was very much like, well, you know, modernity has done all these terrible things and, and then I got to the point where I thought, well, it just seems like none of the ideas really matter. Like they don't have any any impact at all. Uh, you know, the whole culture is stagnating. Um, we're inured to evil and and uh, you know things like abortion. I mean, we, we don't even and none of this gets anywhere. Uh, the arguments don't get anywhere. The way of life uh, isn't compelling to people. It's just this inexorable, inevitable you know, sort of modern secular thing that just keeps going and it becomes more and more lifeless, terrible. And I, I mean, it's a, just the slipstream in which we we lived, which is historic, where all of a sudden you wake up one day and look around and go, no, everything that we all have been struggling for all of a sudden, you know, in the midst of, uh, granted the shit show, all of a sudden becomes vitally important. And all of a sudden, you, you know, the spell breaks and people are looking to unite and connect with others of like mind who, who agree on, you know, very, very deep issues. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, the boomers control over things starts to dissipate. And, you know, you, you, you start to uh, really be able to have an impact. And so, I mean, what James is saying, it's just it's absolutely true. Like, the, look, the, all, all the everything was true. <laughs> All the, <laughs> the truths were true, and what they told you was important if you understood the tradition is important, and those things are, uh, I'm not going to say win out, but they are going to constitute the dividing line now. And, and that means that, you know, you can't, um, you, you can't sit around with the doomerism because y- you could have, just in terms of one person's life, a, a much better quality of life uh, being with the bros and fighting the good fight, right? Uh, and be much happier even in the midst of tragedy than many people who lived during peacetime and just sort of dissipated themselves away, uh, you know, laying on their bed thinking emo thoughts. And, and, and so the future in a way is, is bright because it's, it's as if all things are, are sort of possible again. Yeah, I mean, one of the, you know, capital B-I big ideas that uh, I think we probably talk about more at Claremont and on this show than other people whose job it is to like launder Plato's insights or whatever. Like one of, one of the big ideas is, is, is prudence, right? And, and prudence is intimately connected in classical thought with practical wisdom, right? Phrenesis, which is exactly the skill, the virtue of doing what you're talking about, Matt. Like it's not going to be some perfect platonic form of like the true the good and the beautiful around you you live in a messy broken fallen world and and as we've discussed at some length like adversity even of the relatively minor kinds that we are now facing in this country like adversity inspires the actual execution of the virtues like the you know (laughs) yeah you can't actually as james is indicating you can't like wave your arms around in some grand atlantean way and cause the wheel of time to reverse or the cycle of regimes to turn back but that's it was ever thus and and you know the it's it's actually genuinely nobody's uh it's it's given to nobody to understand where the next 20 30 40 years will take us at a, at a civilizational level whether like the west is dead or the west will revive or or what have you but it's very much within your control to ask the question that that Plato, in fact, asks in the Republic, which is like, if I can envision in my head what it would look like for society to live perfectly, to be perfectly organized and virtuously structured, what if I shrink that down to the level of the individual human being? What would it look like for my soul to be perfectly organized and perfectly structured? And what are the concrete actions that I might take within my household and those 
people around me that will cause that vision of the world to come more into being in the sphere of my control. Like there is still such a sphere, despite what Bloomberg might tell you. There, there actually does still exist a range of possible options before you, some better, some worse, and all of them, you know, best evaluated against the landmark of, of like the God who loves you and the, the virtue which will draw you closer to him. Like these things all still exist and are in fact more apparent, I suppose, when you have to ask like, you know, where, where should I move? so that I can protect my family from the rapacious sociopaths that want to mutilate and destroy them. Like, wh where should I, you know, where should I go? Where should I put my, my livelihood, you know, in the context of a, of a crumbling economy? Like, you know, those are high stakes choices. And like, some of them actually do fall to you. Yeah. And we, this is, it's so true. I mean, look, you can reclaim your agency, right? I mean, that was, that was, uh, I mean, you can reclaim your agency even when you're in slavish conditions, which is what they want to put everyone in, right? But there's almost a heightened sense of, of, um, of that reclamation project of saying, no, I am captain of this ship. I can organize what's within myself and uh, in conformity and humility with a greater order, of course, uh, otherwise you'll fail. But, but, but there, there, there is there's a heightened awareness, I think, coming for many people uh, in the midst of, uh, you know, the crushing uh, large scale sort of trends where, you know, you can reclaim your agency and even find, dare I say it, in the midst of tragedy and everything else, more happiness because of that uh, than you would have in a, a kind of fake uh, peacetime. And, and that's that's where, where we're headed. And, you know, people will help you. I mean, this is the thing right right now. If you push on any of these fronts we're talking about. You'll be surprised at how many people will reach out and say, thank God you're doing this. Like, Let me help you do this. Local politics is a great example right now. I mean, everyone, you know, in these school board outfits or the people running for a city council, I'm engaged in some stuff uh, in Texas with this. It's unbelievable how many people are just coming out of the woodwork and coming together and saying, no, no, we're going to fight, you know, and, and you, you show a little bit of, uh, of spine and you show a little bit of life right now. And people of like mind will congregate to you. You won't be alone. Uh, and and this is this is the hope in the midst of all this. And it is it, it's a paradox, right? But there really is something to a cognizance of your own agency and what you are in control of when you are forced by larger you know currents to realize what you're not able to do. And as James wisely said, you know you can't change the world. What, what does it even mean? What is that talking about? That's part of, you know, that's part of this uh, televisual fantasy. It's crazy. But, but once you get that out of your mind, once you realize you can't do that, you start to focus on, you know, little things that you can't control. And, and it's, it's um, what really is enlivening to me is there's a hell of a lot of people in America right now, slowly coming to the same conclusion. Yeah, I, I think another sort of trend in national politics that was not entirely black pilled that we're kind of touching on is the trend that culminated for us at, at least or for for me in Virginia in the Virginia election not because Glenn Yonkin is like the hero who's going to save us all but simply because in in that instance it it finally happened that the many percolating groundswell movements and trends and the you know the Chris Rufo of it all plus the angry parents of it all plus the local politics of it all finally combined into a W like finally made it produced a win and i think that the reason that was so inspiring was 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 that was because we then thought well actually you know it's not just an impossible endless stream of l's um, and and it's also inspiring to me to see how the cathedral is running scared i mean we've talked about how how spiritually weak the ruling class actually is and and the fact that their bluster about how much they control is is you know maybe them protesting too much um, but I want to throw into the ring as we're talking about this, another article that we had mentioned before we started recording, which is uh, on HuffPost. The headline is, I joined a far right group of moms. What I witnessed was frightening. They're frightened. They're scared about these parents who are gathering together, you know, from various different political, previously existing political camps to oppose things like what happened in Loudoun County. They're, they're scared about that. Let me <laughs> read to you. This is not only... Uh, the funniest part of the article, but also they, they use it as the subhead of the article. So you, you, they must actually be proud of it. She, this, this, you know, like 
fed basically infiltrating the uh, infiltrating this group of moms and and the the author writes another woman raised her hand look I know we want to change school boards she said but elections aren't until 2023 what do we do until then we just can't sit around and let them attack our kids we have to do something the something is re reproduced in all capital letters here here's the next line I caught a gleam in the woman's eye I didn't like. Was there some flirtation with insurrection being suggested here? What exactly was she saying? So, I mean, this is actually a perfect picture of the scenario on the ground. You are up against people who are f fighting a demon entirely of their own construction and fantasy. And that just because it's completely invented doesn't mean they can't do a lot of damage, doesn't mean they don't say and do horrible things toward the people they're afraid of. But it's it, genuinely people who are boxing with shadows, looking up at people who are tr coming together and just genuinely asking that question. We can't just sit around and let them attack our kids. What are we going to do? And in fact, there are, it turns out, some good answers to that, that question available in, in many localities in America. And, and it's just it, it's merely the, you know, absolutely hysterical fear of that that causes people to write articles like this at all. Well, it is remarkable that what we are confronting is a genuine fear of politics, of the hmm. actual practice of citizen politics uh, and a deepening it's becoming something akin to a religious, uh, an article of religious devotion uh, that that real politics, genuine citizen politics doesn't work, isn't to be trusted, is cover for evil, um, perpetuates injustice. I mean, people are genuinely spiritually convinced that our form of government is fundamentally unjust. And that conviction penetrates all the way down to the level of the school board, penetrates all the way down to the level of the homeowners association. Uh, and, you know, far right, what does that mean today? That means someone with mores from the 80s who's actually doing something about it now. Uh, one a piece of news that, that still matters and is going to continue to matter is you know, the demographic breakdown of Trump voters in the election. All those indicators like, wait a minute, it's not just, you know, it's like people named Cletus in landlocked counties voting for Donald Trump. Uh, that trend continues to prove out that identity politics has been unsuccessful at terraforming every non-straight white male in America uh, into adopting the same, you know, political theology. Uh, I think we've all seen the... Uh, the polls of, uh, of, of Hispanic voters, whatever you want to call them, uh, now, you know, at, at or near uh, majority favorability for, for Trump. Um, obviously, social media is full of endless conversation about sort of like single white women and, and where they fit in to the, the configuration of power in America. Um, and and there's, just, there's just no... Um, there's no coalition on the level that we're being presented, um, uh, whether you want to call it an anti-Trump coalition or a pro-vax coalition or a pro, I mean, social credit, so you, what, whatever, however you want to skin it, the reality is that politics is not dead uh, and that the popular response to, uh, to all these efforts to squeeze citizen political life out of the system uh, has just led to a resurgence of politics. Yeah, the politicophobia is like a really important trend, James, that you're identifying. And I think one major series of news stories that we haven't touched on yet is the whole vaccine mandate thing the, and, and, the, and the realignment that it inspired. I mean, gradually in response basically to Biden coming out and saying this isn't about your freedom and threatening to take people's jobs away, there has emerged a kind of center line around which others congregate. And the center line is, you know, I was vaxxed or I wasn't vaxxed, but I, you know, I, I'm, I'm vaguely pro-vaccine or pro-choice, but I'm anti-mandate. And, and there's a whole enormous group of people that falls into that camp. There are people that, you know, did get the vax, there are people that didn't get the vax, there are people that think you should, people that think it doesn't matter, think people that even like think it's a, you know, a, a health hazard, all agree that this is is tyranny. And the reason for it is, is that 
if you show yourself willing to coerce people into doing something with threats of unemployment and blackmail and subal subaltern status, then you reveal that your whole rhetoric of, of choice is actually a facade, is a farce. You, you can tell people that you want them to be free all you like and that you believe in our democracy and the democratic process. And then when the gloves are off at the end of the day, it turns out that like, you know, you were really just giving them a kind of grace period trial run in which they could do the thing that you want them to do voluntarily. Uh, you know, that that ain't going to fly with a whole bunch of people. And it actually is a real mask off moment, because when Lori Lightfoot or Joe Biden or any of these, you know, Gavin Newsom, when they when these people come out and say, like, you know, our patience is wearing thin, they reveal exactly how they regard politics of the kind that we believe in in America or that the American founding was designed to install, you know, the, the thing where people actually look at a situation, decide how to proceed and then vote together uh, or decide together about how to organize their collective lives like that is is quite explicitly in the context of covid politics like that's all of a show all a charade all a farce for the people who consider themselves to be in charge because if you if you know if the outcome isn't what they want they'll just kind of rig the game and like you know threaten you with worse and worse consequences until you until you back down okay here's another story that uh probably nobody would have seen and uh, seen coming five years ago. Well, maybe some of us would have, but um, you're going to have to forgive me for just even reading the title of this piece. But um, I do think it's important that we talk about the like crazy transhumanist social uh, psychosexual dimension of, of this year and, and our moment. So here's an article in New York Magazine, uh, once a serious outlet publication, I would, I would venture to say. Um, and they have published a first person article called my penis myself um written by a trans man that is to say a woman who uh has obviously taken her hormones and had surgery to look and uh, appear like a man and um it's essentially a lengthy investigation sort of introspective self-examination over the author's various motives for having a phalloplasty and what it was like and why, you know, some people do and don't want to do this. Um, not, I should hasten to add, in terms of whether, you know, gender ideology is even coherent, whether there is in fact such a thing as this sort of floating entity called gender that you must realign your your clay vessel to to hold um but more in terms of like you know whether it's uh whether you need a penis to be a man um whether it's valid to have one or whether penises are inherently evil um and so besides the hilarity of this article it's a good sort of temperature taking you know indicator of a certain class of elite opinion and, and rhetoric over what man is, what humanity is and, and what relation we stand uh, into our bodies and, and to the rest of the world. So I toss this one into the ring and ask you guys, what is the state of, um, of, of the human body and the human relation to God in this year of our Lord 2021? Small questions, you know. Yeah, yeah, minor issues. Well, I mean, we're talking about phrenesis and we're talking about we really, you know, the gloves are off now. Right, but we have to bring in fake genitalia. I mean, you know. Oh, right. Very important. Well, it it, it is mentioned in this article that the fake penis in question uh, is large. So these are actually big questions. It turns out. Uh, good point. Good point. Very big <laughs> questions. Huge, really. Um, yeah, I I mean, I think that the the way in which this kind of it's not vulgar at this point. It's it's more like. Uh, it's more, you know, something along the lines of grotesque, right? I mean, monstrous um, in the old sense. I mean, you're you're uh, you're Frankenstein'ing uh, the human body and encouraging that in all kinds of inter interestingly weird ways. <laughs> um, it starts out sexual; um, it won't end there. And this fascination with you know fake ethics but really what's going on is that the terraforming um right the fourth the aforementioned terraforming where you're just going to take the body and and uh, rearrange the lego bricks however however you want and get everyone used to that you know i mean we we need to get used to this and there's going to be a lot more of this it's not going to end 
uh, and it's going to be a lot more disturbing. And really, there's no end to the sort of physical reorganization uh, and kind of ugliness that they're going to propose and, in fact, uh, potentially enforce upon uh, their slaves or their, you know, their, their human uh, experiment. <laughs> the, the humans they will experiment on and and you know the, the 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 underlying philosophy here is there's no there's no boundaries for any of this anymore um and you know in a way you see this um in the west with with fauci and the virus right i mean it, it's as if a gain of function research you know doing dangerous research to mess with nature to make uh viruses more powerful I mean, that would have been repulsive and uh, a kind of a fearful thing, a thing that would terrify us and make movies about 20 years ago. And now it's just like, well, that, that's just a, a thing we have to get over. We have to get around because, of course, we should be doing this research on viruses to make them more deadly. Um, but we'll just need to work with our partners in China on that. Right. Um, and 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 that's the sense, uh, you know, in a, in a more uh, a more focused way, more concentrated, intense way, when it comes to the transing of the body, the mutilation of the body, and then to talk about it and sort of uh, baseline celebrate in a way uh, through these fake ethical issues, what you're doing is just introducing and pushing the notion that we can rearrange the meat sack however we want. And there is no overarching order. And it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. In fact, it's good. In fact, it's ethical. And, and there's something really sinister about this just because, of course, it, the level of control that it implies that people will actually accept as good uh, is, is what's so terrifying. I mean, this is a horror movie. This is a horror movie in which, uh, you know, people aren't forced into anything. It's even more horrific. They're welcoming their own, you know, the desecration of their own temple. They're welcoming the destruction of their, their very selves. Uh, and it's 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 disgusting, right? And I, there is a sense in which I, I just um, it's a long ramble, but one thing I'll stop. I mean, there is a sense in which this development does have a silver lining, which is that it's so far gone. I mean, this is you know the excesses of last century, which were terrible. Like we're 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 running in the red on on that level. It's so far gone that it will provoke pockets of resistance that will be much uh, cleaner and brighter uh, than you usually see, you know, in, in most of normal kind of times. And so, I mean, I, I do think like the kinds of divisions or what James was saying earlier, like the radical divergence between how people want to live will become more and more apparent um, as they, as they push this kind of thing. But I, I guess we're, I, what disturbs me most is we're still living in denial. Right. We're still living in a time where people are like, oh, what? That's kind of disgusting. Why are you guys talking about that on a podcast? And, oh, that's just totally. some weird libs writing about that. Right. They're not really going to trans my kids. Then you go to the local library where that guy lives. And it's like, no, nah, they're, they're transing your kids. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, let me preface these remarks by saying that I am definitely 110 percent not explicitly comparing. These kinds of acts to the Holocaust. That said, go on. We are clearly watching unfold in front of us a holocaust of monstrosity where the horror is not that a, a, uh, you know, a community or a people is being subjected to the most dehumanizing brutality, but that a social contagion is spreading where people want to subject themselves to monstrosity. Why? What is the desire? What is it? And what is oftentimes sold explicitly or implicitly to us is, well, you can be liberated from yourself. You find yourself in a situation where nothing seems to work out the way you want, where you have problems that you can't resolve, where you feel sad all the time. You don't know why. Problem, 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 problem. Something's wrong with you. You're sick. And what is sick about you is yourself. And so if you only do X or Y or Z, you are going to be able to purify or redeem yourself or escape from break the chains of selfhood that enclose you. You can become someone who you aren't right now. And 
in some ways, this is, you know, this is an ancient doctrine and some things never change. Uh, but in another sense, it seems to me that, you know, even, even people who preach the religion of self-transformation uh, actually understand that you can only run away from your soul for so long before it catches back up to you. And the stories about people who detransition or whatever, or did the hormones or added a part or took a part away, you know, they found that like, well, shit, I'm still depressed after all, you know, oh, well, I, I didn't stop cutting myself after all. And the, there is no cure for soul sickness if you deny the existence of your soul. And the spectacle of so many people who seem to understand that they are soul sick, but seem also to understand that the best that they can do is achieve this sort of momentary catharsis where they forget that they have a soul. Um, it's in every soy face that you see on the internet. It's in every nuke head emoji that you see on Twitter. It's people who want to have, they're chasing that experience of their senses just being kind of overwhelmed and the voice of their soul being drowned out and the shadows in their soul being, you know, zapped away by this nuclear blast of transformative experience. They're chasing this kind of catharsis that creates the illusion that they can really once and for all be liberated of their soul and all of its, you know, knots and, and, and monstrosity and darkness and error and limitation and mortality, all of the things that make us human, warts and all. They know that there's no real escape from that. Oh, I'll upload my consciousness to the internet one day. You can't even explain what your consciousness is, bro. They know it's not possible. So they, it's, it's like chasing the next hit of choose your own drug. Uh, <laughs> and we've progressed to a point in our society where, you know, the, the milder drugs have been legalized. That's not good enough. The harder drugs are freely available. That's not good enough. The really, really worst of the very hardest drugs are a little bit more difficult to get, but you can still get them. And those aren't good enough. And then you can invent the internet and spend all day on that, chasing that feeling of, of escaping out from under yourself, of losing consciousness of yourself. And that's not good enough. So what is? Maybe it's sawing a penis-shaped piece of skin out of my thigh and surgically attaching it to my crotch. I don't think that's going to be enough either. And, and we haven't even gotten to the point where it's like human centipede, but voluntary. Right. Uh, we haven't even, you know, I mean, you know, there are there, the, it, BDSM monasteries, like these things are coming. They're coming unless there is a moment when enough people accept that they're human, that they have souls, that there is no escape from these things. Probably even if you just put the shotgun in your mouth and pull the trigger, not that some people won't do that. Uh, you know, that, that, that you can't even oh, well, maybe if I don't have children, then I'll be able to escape the burdens of being me. Uh, no, that, that sh follows you around. I mean, Michelle Ulevec is, is putting out another book. Mm. It's called Annihilate. It's coming next month. And, I, you know, I don't know what, I mean, at this point, this guy's probably thinking like, I'm just going to have to starve myself in a cage in front of Notre Dame <laughs> in order for people to finally go like, oh, maybe I should take his argument seriously. Mm. What's it going to take? This is where martyrs come from. This is where saints come from. People whose testimony is bodily and in their soul and the reality of their humanity in its totality is revealed to people in an undeniable way. And so if there's any sort of silver lining in this Holocaust of monstrosity, it is that sometimes the line here can be very thin and this is, you know, deep psychological, spiritual territory, but it is not unknown for someone who pursues a path of complete debasement and self-alienation to 
mysteriously experience a quiet moment that they will probably never be able to describe and can never appear on any sort of public record or transcription or sit on a server somewhere. And instead, they devote their lives to Christ or they renounce all of their sinful ways. It happens. It's happened before. And I suspect that it's going to happen again in, in various ways. Yeah. And this, uh, this idea of the, you know, the saint that you mentioned is, is very much like these are the kinds of times when this, this emerges. And, and when you say, you know, these are people who give a visceral example to everyone else, as James said, bodily, that's so powerful. Uh, you know, people think like, I don't know what they think. Like, do they even know what a saint is? I mean, a saints, halos, I don't know, angel clothes. I, I don't know what they think about when you say that word, but but saints, I mean, these are people who make such a profound impact on everyone around them. Um, and they're usually, you know, almost almost bizarre because they're so, they stand out in, with such kind of fire, with, with such light. Uh, that, and the, there's a lot of heat there, too. People, I mean, people look and they can't, they can't really wrap their mind around what's going on when people achieve, you know, this kind of greatness. But the impact of it is is always profound. And, you know, what you're describing is like, look, the, when these figures arise, you know, people see it and it just it just changes their life. It changes the way they look at what's going on. And I mean, this may be, um, uh, you know, California, California, ing my Texas or denigrating the holy. But. It, you see a little bits of it when now when people you see how people uh, gravitate towards um, these online figures or media figures who just speak truth to power, right? Uh, they see people who are unafraid of the regime, and so they gravitate around them, and they say, "Well, these people are leaders; they're willing to do that." But the kind of person who stands against, you know, this bodily mutilation, this really like weird demonic stuff. Um, this evil stuff, you know, they, they, they also, I mean, their body is involved, like they're actually threatened to the point of death, torture, or whatever. And the impact of that on everyone else is to profoundly change and move their life. And I, I do, I do think like, to what you're saying, I, I'll just, I confess again, like, I, I got to a point where I thought, yeah, but that happens in other times and places. You know, I, I thought that would happen here. It doesn't happen here. But you don't get these, you know, revivals and changes of uh, you know, changes of intellectual frameworks and, and entire worldviews, uh, some people would say, it doesn't really happen all at once. And it's not really possible now. And all of that was a lie. I mean, all of that was a lie, because everything that people were trying to change the last 30, 40, 50 years is now we're now entering a place in which, um, you know, the stasis of that period is is just over, no matter what, you know, happens in our lifetimes. The stasis that we experienced before has been shown to be an illusion. And, and now we're in some very serious times where you literally have people who are, yeah, uh, you know, whatever, uh, stitching a, a uh, you know, penis on themselves made from their own skin and then wondering why they're still not happy and wondering if it's the right thing to do. You literally have people who are trying to mutilate children and they're proud of it and celebrating it. And, and never mind, you know, uh, the way we regard the unborn and all the rest of what we're doing in genetics. So, so yeah, I mean, I guess well, it's kind of, it's a great American mind quantum uh, moment, right guys? I mean, we're mm -hmm. saying like, and, but in the midst of all this, the cool thing is, the cool thing sense. to do is to convert to Christianity. I mean, literally, <laughs> but like, but um, yeah, I mean, you guys are making me think of another much discussed article about uh, constructed genitalia, which came out, you know, I'm old enough to remember when the New York Times was publishing the inverse of this New York Magazine piece, Andrea Long Chu, um, whom some people will know as the kind of darling of what I think is now third wave transgenderism. I could be wrong about that, but very celebrated in these circles, this, this man who is uh, transitioning to a woman um, wrote a piece called My New Vagina Won't Make Me Happy. And it was an explicit 
uh, defense of exactly the psychology that you just articulated, James. I am chasing this desire that I have to reconfigure my body. And in the wake of it, I, you know, when the hangover subsides, it, I, I, I don't feel happier, but I still want it. And there were many, many pieces that were kind of excerpted from this, you know, to toss about in the various camps on, on Twitter. And it is a, a really horrifying piece. You know, it makes you think like this is a mentally unwell person who just needs like the hospitalization. But in any case, you know, says all this stuff. I was not suicidal before hormones. Now I often am. Like many of my trans friends, I've watched my dysphoria balloon since I began to transition. And all of this was, you know, subject to much comment and discussion. But the line in it that that struck me most, actually, was this very simple and distilled expression of a certain philosophy, which is desire and happiness are independent agents. Which is to say that the thing that I want and my flourishing and my joy are totally separate things and we should simply accept that and doctors should just give me whatever surgery I ask for uh, for this reason because really I'm, I'm going with my desire. I'm not going <laughs> with my happiness. And of course, you know, the, I, I suppose I could say this until I was blue in the face, but the classical assessment of this problem is that your desire is meant to be a guide toward your happiness, but it's broken. The antenna is broken. Pleasure is just what it means for you to feel like something is good. Uh, the whole project of life is aligning that feeling with what is actually good. And and this is effectively the New York Times piece and the New York Mag piece and the whole kind of mass psychosis we're going through is effectively a, a, a complete reversal, a complete denial of that classical idea that something about, you know, your desire is supposed to lead you toward joy and flourishing and fulfillment. This says, no, actually, joy and flourishing and fulfillment are fake concepts. They're probably imposed upon you by society, and they certainly don't have any kind of absolute reality in the mind of God or elsewhere. Um, and so really just, you know, it's, it's your desire all the way down. It's what you want today. It's what you're doing today, um, even if it makes you literally want to kill yourself. And I think that, Matt, all the stuff you're talking about, about physical witness, public witness, right, embodying something. Um, it, it, the Christian, the Christian truth is well taken that because we live in a fallen world, you know, the outward appearance and the inward reality don't always match up, don't always align. You know, this is one of the central observations of the Gospels, I think, is that like this man was not born blind because of sin, but so that the glory of God could be revealed in him. And yet. Without Christ, of course, we take that observation too far to the point of insanity, as we do with all the Gospels now. We remove the God part and we're just left with this collection of insane statements, like, for example, that there's no correlation between how something's working out for you and whether or not you ought to be doing it. I mean, this is another, you know, before Christ, we already had in place the kind of basic intuition that, again, in book four of the Republic is defended that, you know, Justice is the health of the soul. And so irrespective of like whatever rewards you may get for it, it looks like something to be pursuing virtue and to be to become excellent at being human. And if something that we're doing at a national level is making us uglier, more infertile, suicidal, unhappy, miserable, then that thing is probably actually bad in some absolute way. And we, we feel scared to say that because it sounds like, oh, like, you know, being uh, looking like a Greek statue is the only way to be morally virtuous. But it's not that. It's just to say that actually there's such a thing as what it looks like uh, to be flourishing, to have eudaimonia. And it's not taking a chunk out of your leg and sticking it in, in your underpants. It's actually being a Greek person. That is, that is the key. Being Greek. Yes. Well, <laughs> I, I see what I don't know. Did. Spencer, Mr. apparently, Poulos. I've heard, thinks, it, thinks it's looking like a Greek statue. I mean, that's. <laughs> well, I, I, it doesn't make me unhappy. Yeah, you know, I'll say that much. <laughs> well, I, I, I think this. Um, yeah, I, I think I think one of the things that, that correlates with this. Uh, I know <clears throat> producer Jake knows and others. I'm supposed to write things now, but, you know, I'm. I'm in a, I'm in, I'm on a journey now, uh, where I don't read or write anything. Uh, we just make things happen, uh, in a, in a kind of, uh, kind of strange state of being in action. Uh, but, but if, but, but one of the things I, I would love to write is the underlying principle of some of this on the bad side just strikes me in a very, it's, it's metaphysical. And that means, you know, it's, it's simple, right? The philosophic truths that are the most simple, the most hard to understand. But the, the, if I was to describe it in a metaphysical way, it's this. 
It's that people do not think that there should be consequences for wrong choices or any of their desires, right? There should be no negative consequences. And that sounds almost like a boomer, but I, I mean that in a very, a very deep sense. They, they don't think that there should be consequences. And the reason why is because they should be able to write their own story, right? Their, their, own, uh, their own lines upon the page. And there, are, there is no rule order they have to fall within. There's no uh, grooves or direction uh, or, um, you know, um, uh, like current that instinct or desire or reason itself points towards. It should just be a blank slate that I can write however I want. And this is actually an insane view. I mean, this is to make yourself God, to say there are no restrictions at all, and there should be no repercussions for anything I choose. And the most visceral way to see that is people with guns, right? We've talked about this before on the show. This is episode 100. This is way back. But, hmm. yeah, you know, people, I don't care who's right or wrong or who's being fascist or racist or whatever with the gun. There's just the brute fact, like material fact of someone has a loaded gun and it's pointed at you. Guess what? None of us can do what we want in that situation. Like if you go attack that person with the gun, there is a very good chance that's loaded and pointed at you and they're telling you to stop. There's a very good chance you will be shot. And, and you, you, I mean, that should be obvious to any human being. It's obvious to any five-year-old. But it's not obvious to our society because they look at that and go, Oh no, that's not the case. You know, it, that's a that's a terrible accident. In fact, it's an act of evil. It's not an accident. There, the, the, that idea, right? That no, no, I can, I can, I can chop my Johnson off, and I can make a gaping wound and call myself a woman, and there should be no negative consequences for that whatsoever. I'm completely fine. Let me do a bunch of other crazy things with my physical body that make no sense, and and, and there should be no consequences whatsoever. That literally is to make yourself God, right? There, there are no, it's a, it's a blank slate and out of something, there is just me. Out of nothing, there is me and my will. And I mean, that, that's, uh, that's both evil and insane. <laughs> All right. Uh, these are good parting messages, I think. A moral of the story, end of 2021 for us. Um, your soul is real. Uh, you, what you do matters. And in, indeed, the way that things are working out for you is an indicator of, of <laughs> what you ought to be doing going forward. Um, you can make personal choices that have consequences, and you're also not going to change the world. So rejoice evermore. Happy, <laughs> happy Christmas. Happy New Year. And on our 100th ap episode, I think it's fair to say from all of us that we are enormously grateful to anybody that's listening to uh, our voices at this moment, to people that have been with us from the beginning, to people that just found this podcast. Um, it's a true pleasure on a Wednesday to sit down and um, seek some sanity in, in communion with one another and in communion with you. Uh, we hope it's been a benefit and uh, a lifeline for you in 2021. And we're looking forward to many more episodes. Here's to the 150th, the 200th, and here's to 2022. Thank you for listening to The Roundtable. If you want to support our work, visit claremont.org forward slash donate. And if you want to learn more about all our projects and writing, visit our websites at americanmind.org, claremont.org, claremontreviewbooks.com, and our brand new Washington, D.C.-based Center for the American Way of Life at D.C claremont.org. Since this is our last shot at the end of the year, I will also mention all of our other various projects that uh, we should plug because they're all good. Uh, go to newfounding.com.org or .com, Matt, I always forget. Newfounding. .com. Yep, newfounding.com uh, to check out the uh, network that Matt is building. Go to humanforever.us.us uh, to buy and read James's brilliant book about actually many of the things we talked about today. Um, and I guess head to youngheretics.com and listen to my other podcast too. Please rate, share, and subscribe at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks to the production and engineering crew, Jake Gannon and Alyssa Lee. And thank you all for listening. 